All right. Um, I want to welcome everybody from taking your afternoon with us. This is the Michigan Local Food Council Network's um, first one of um, first one of two in a series of webinars about fund development. Um, again, um, this work is special is sponsored by the W. K. Kellogg Foundation and the Michigan Health Endowment, um, and um, we're excited for. Um, you all to be here and to share this information and as with all our phone calls and meetings all the information is shared for informational purposes only um, just to note also we're going to be recording and posting these so if you didn't have a chance to if you couldn't get everything or you think oh a colleague would really like that um, there'll be that opportunity um, and also maybe you're doing part one and, uh, and somebody else from your council is doing part two um, both, both of them will be up what we would like to do is to start with introductions, and I'm gonna ask you to share your name, organization, and what inspires you to do that work, and that's really gonna help our um, trainer, Genbor, help you and tailor this information to you as we go through. Um, so I am going to ask folks, also, during the webinar, we're gonna, it's gonna be participatory, so if you feel like it, it would be great if you could not only show, um, if you feel comfortable, you could not only show video as well as audio. Um, so from right right now, um, I will start calling off names and if you could introduce yourself, unmute, introduce yourself, and then again, share name, organization, and what inspires you to do this work. Um, so uh, Markel, um, you're first on my screen, so I'm gonna ask you to, Kick us off. Okay, I can stop eating for a second. Um, <laughs> I'm Markel. I'm with the Washtenaw County Food Policy Council. Um, I'm the chair of our council and we're a subcommittee of our county board of commissioners. My day job though is at Food Gatherers, the food bank serving Washtenaw County. And um, I am driven to do this work because I love food. I love loving people through food, but I strongly believe in the opportunity of equity through policy change and making sure that everyone has access to food because we have policies that support that. All right. I also want to take the opportunity to introduce Liz Gensler to folks who don't know her. She's going to be mostly on mute, um, but she's the co-facilitator of the network along with me. So we're your partners in, in food, um, in food councils. Uh, Abby Harper. Can Hi, I'm Abby Harper. I'm with the um, Capital Area Food Council and MSU Extension based in Lansing. Um, what drives me to do this work? Uh, yeah, I guess reiterating a lot of what Markel said, but just a um, passion for creating systems of food production and consumption that um, meet the needs of the entire population. Great. Thanks, Abby. Winona. Oh, you are still, we can't hear you, Winona. Okay, is this better? Yes, that is excellent. Okay, it's amazing what happens when you take yourself off mute. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Winona Bynum. I'm with the Detroit Food Policy Council. Um, what inspires me to do this work is, again, I got, I'm a dietitian and I want everybody to have healthy food and access to it. Great. Um, Joe Bixler. How you doing, Joe? I'm good. Uh, Joe Bixler, I'm uh, with the Thumb Food Policy Council that covers the five Thumb counties. And um, <clears throat> my interest is uh, more on the, uh, on the producer side relative to the food system, but we also have a keen interest as a council to develop uh, food security. Um, action steps and egg literacy. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, Vanessa. Hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Garcia Polanco, and we the Center for Union Food System, and also grad student at MSU. I'm just interested on this webinar as a whole because I feel that's one of the skills that I'm lacking the most, aside from leading a really intensive one day fundraisers and like other kinds of alternative fundraisers. I feel like. I don't really know how to fundraise for money and internally applying for grants. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, and thanks for all your hard work with the network um, these past couple of months. Um, Nicole. 
Hi, I am with the Saginaw um, Food Council, our FACS group, as well as the um, Bay County Food Council. I co-chair both of them. Um, and then I also work for the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. Um, and it's, um, the drive to do this is a lot of what everybody has kind of said and echoing that of um, making sure that we're creating food access for everybody and um, that they can get healthy and nutrition foods. Um, but even more so that we, through collaboration, make that access um, easier. Um, kind of streamline it that those issues here. So working on that with our food councils. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, Rachel, I'm in the UP. Um, my name is Rachel Presley. I, um, I'm working for the Western UP Planning and Development Region and I organize for the Western UP Food Systems Council. Um, I'm inspired um, similar to how everyone else has mentioned, but I'm also inspired by the um, focus on community resilience through food and collaboration, and then also working for equity and healthy food access for our communities. Great, well, we're so glad you joined us, Rachel. Thank you. Emily. Emily, are you there? <laughs> All right, we're gonna come back to Emily, I'm sure. Um, Christine Ranger. Good morning, Christine Ranger representing here on Shores Food and Farming Council, which is 11 counties in Northeast Michigan. Uh, boy, that's, a, that's an interesting question, but I, uh, would have to say that um, that's the region I grew up in. It's very rural. They're, it's a very poor area. It's underserved. It's overlooked. Uh, and what drives me is the ability or the um, challenge to preserve farmland, increase access to farmland, because uh, we have a lot of it, which will in turn lead to more local food for the residents. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Christine. You're welcome. Uh, Larry Dyer. On the other side of Northern Michigan. Um, I'm, I'm Larry Dyer. I'm representing the Local Food Alliance of Northern Michigan. And um, with apologies, I got in late and I missed the question that I'm supposed to be answering. Oh, the question you're supposed to be answering is what inspires you to do this work? Oh, um, what inspires you to do this work? Um, boy, this is the kind of work I've been doing all my life it just seems like food is pretty basic to our culture and our relationships with the ecosystems that we live in and so so that's my fault i don't know um it's 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 pretty crucial pretty essential to our community and i think it's an important part of of it, especially the local food movement is an important part of happening up here in in northern michigan recent developments in the in the community and the culture yeah all right Emily, are you back? Oh, Emily, she says, hi, I'm sorry, I'm on, she's in a setup in a public place. She is part of Kent County Food Council formation team. She's inspired by the sense of community that is embedded in food issues. So thanks, Emily. Um, thanks for joining us um, from where you're at. Um, we really appreciate it. All right, did I miss anybody? Well, I'm sure there might be some people who would join us later, but right now I want to introduce Jen Boer, um, who um, is a fund development consultant um, in Traverse City area, right? Or Actually, Boyne City, close. Boyne City. Further north. Okay. A bit. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and um, but um, we connected with Jen um, just a little over a month ago, and she's been great to put together. Um, a webinar for you um, and learned a lot and talked a lot, um, learned a lot about food councils in the last month um, in order to um, really bring you this information. So John, I wanna turn it over to you and number one, also thank you for um, all the hard work. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you everybody who has joined the webinar, the call today. As Megan mentioned, I really want to hear from you. I don't want this to just be a one-sided conversation with me uh, talking at you for two hours because I'll get lonely and you'll get bored. So if you have a question along the way, 
Um, please don't hesitate to unmute yourself. And if you can also show video just so I know who I'm talking to at that time, um, that's just kind of my style when it comes to facilitation. I like to hear from you. You can chime in. Um, we wanna make sure we get your questions answered about the material that I'm presenting along the way. If you have any specific questions that you think, you know, big picture stuff, uh, if you can maybe table that uh, till the end, well, I'm gonna leave at least 20 minutes at the end for question and answer. Um, so we'll make sure we get those questions at that time as well. But if you're anything like me, there's times I need to ask the question when I have it or I forget it. So <laughs> again, please feel free. Um, so fun development, where do you start? You know, that's the big question everyone has. And I have to say, just listening to all of you this morning, this afternoon, you're already halfway there. Having that passion and being inspired to do the work that you do and that care for community betterment is, is, is taking you halfway there. Um, however, in my experience with organizations, be it fully volunteer organizations, um, startup organizations, or highly sophisticated, organizations, there are some key elements that you need to have in place before you can even think about um, asking for funds or asking for support. And oops, let me move forward here. There we go. With that said, I know that on the call we have organizations that are potentially in their infancy, not just in the area of fund development, but maybe development as a whole. We have area organizations or councils that are more developed, but maybe just now starting to think about fund development. And then we have or councils that are now already beginning to bear fruit and um, are more advanced in fund development. So that being said, even though I'm knowledgeable of that, I hope that everybody on the call also has that same mindset because I certainly don't want to leave out those that are not as sophisticated um, as organizations or in the area of fund development but I also wanna make sure those that are, are more sophisticated in fund development gain something from this webinar as well. So that being said, um, we need to first start out by all understanding that fund development strategy is not one size fits all. You know, just like our organization, our councils are at different stages of life cycle, fund development looks different based on the organization itself, your capacity, as well as your community. So unfortunately, there is not like a magic pill that says if you follow this one thing, you're gonna be successful and money is going to come flooding in your doors. However, if we do, and we're very disciplined at establishing some of those fundamentals, you'll realize that the process becomes a lot easier. So you start to position yourself where you're more comfortable with fund development and um, the, the relationships that you build will result in the, the funding down the road. So it is an investment, and it is really important that you understand that if it may be working for this council, you know, later when we share, share examples, it might need to be customized to work effectively for your council. So one thing that I found very in, informational, and this is something that I know all of you have access to, um, was information that was provided by the John Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable, Livable Future. And even though we're not one size fits all in fund development, the strategies are not gonna look the same for all of us. There were some reoccurring themes that were brought to my attention that I think are worth sharing. When I say reoccurring themes, these are things that multiple councils are pursuing or, or these are things that have worked for them in the area of fund development. One of them being pursuing multiple funding streams to support their work. So they're not putting all of their eggs in one basket. They're looking at a diversified funding stream and um, determining what best area, what works best for them, be it state, federal funds, uh, private funding through foundations like your local community foundation. And something that we're going to talk about a little bit later, which I know most councils are not um, heavily involved in, but also considering individuals as donors. They engage funders from a variety of angles. Again, health, environment, community development for maximum support. One thing that I think is really unique and a huge advantage as a food council is that there's so many different elements, different areas of focus that you can fit in, fit within. For example, uh, if it's childhood obesity and how do we help contribute to uh, eliminating that in our communities. If it's finding or ensuring that our local schools have healthy choices at lunchtime and things of that nature. There's so many different avenues 
that your food council could pursue just because it has such a, a big umbrella. Reaching out to funders with distant but related priority areas. So basically what that means is that we just wanna make sure that we know our funders and that we know their areas of interest. And even though they might not be directly aligned with food, um, they may have an indirect relation and we don't wanna, we don't want to rule those opportunities out. Diversify support by requesting small amounts from multiple government agencies and or foundations. And um, this is certainly a reoccurring theme for, for many councils, I'm sure. This, is, this strategy, I think, is something that is used also when you're collaborating with other um, partners in your area and thinking about approaching multiple agencies and or foundations um, to support a collaborative effort. Understand which food system issues resonate most with your target audiences. Again, that's all about knowing who we're talking to to make sure that the information we are presenting is relevant to them. Demonstrate success to attract additional resources to your council. We don't want to be afraid to share our accomplishments, but I know um, if you're anything like me and like most organizations, sometimes we forget to track those. Um, but we certainly want to make sure that we we are tracking our accomplishments on an annual basis, and that's something that we put in our portfolio to share with potential donors. Collaborate with other FPCs, reduce duplicative efforts. And that's something that I think is really um, important, and I'm whether or not that's new information to you or not. It's again, sometimes we get so busy uh, with our daily work, we forget to put our heads up and say, ask ourselves, you know, before I submit this funding request or even consider it, is there somebody else in the community that's already doing this or is there somebody else who should be involved in this effort and um, certainly reduce those duplicate efforts but uh, more importantly collaborate with those strong partners that make your case stronger expand initiatives across county and other jurisdictional boundaries to be eligible for state or regional funding as well as enhance policy collaboration and systems change I think that pretty much says it all Extension positions can play a key role in networking stakeholder groups and attracting support for food system policy changes. In some cases, funders are interested in policy advocacy and system change to provide impetus for their launch of FPCs and model funding transitions on successful ones by other community groups and coalitions. And that's something that I think is really important. And you'll notice here down the road, um, Winona and Markel, I hate to say that I'm putting you on the spot because I'm not, more so I'm putting you in the spotlight because I had a couple examples with your, with your specific councils. I think you're really doing a great job and that kind of leads to this point where, you know, you have a network of people, very successful councils and those that may be struggling, but we can all learn from each other and it's really important that we, we leverage that network. And then of course, leverage support from academic partners to assist in research grant collaboration and other council activities. So again, you guys have a lot of really good resources out there. Um, not that this webinar is not gonna be great, but uh, be sure to access those other resources that are available to you. There was a webinar specifically on um, this topic and I'm sure that's information that we can probably share with you, correct Megan, down the road. Okay, so let's get started. Shifting from fundraising to a culture of philanthropy and fund development. And I remember the first time that I saw this when I was new to the fundraising world, I thought, what in the world does that mean? Is this another buzz word or another road that we're going down that, that only makes sense to the few? But it certainly is not. Because what it means is that we're shifting from an immediate need focus to the big picture focus. And we're not just in it to raise money, raise more money and raise money to meet the critical need that we see in right in front of us. But instead, we're taking the time to develop a culture of philanthropy, not only within our council, but within the community, the community of volunteers, the community of donors. We're, and what that also means is we're not just be, having that knee-jerk reaction to fund development or fundraising. Instead, we're being very thoughtful about it, and we're focusing on what's very important to establish long-term fund development success, and that is building strong relationships. Again, not just strong relationships among our networks, but strong relationships with potential funders. It also involves empowering others to serve as ambassadors. 
you know, as councils, I know that many of you are solely volunteer driven organizations. And if you're not solely volunteer driven, you have staff, you also have a number of volunteers that can serve as effective ambassadors for you, provided that they know how to do that, right? Provided that they have the right information for them to be effective. And the difference between fundraising, short-term gain, short-term focus, is that long-term focus on sustainability. Sustainability of our council, more importantly, sustainability of all those efforts that we've been working toward um, building in our communities. So is it clear as far as that difference between fundraising and fund development? And with the silence, I'm gonna take that as a yes. <laughs> so again, fund development strategy is shifting from or needs to shift from short-term gain to long-term sustainability. And what that does for us is it allows us to look at funding for our organization, how we acquire that, how we sustain that for the long-term versus how are we just going to survive from year to year to year. Because as every council can attest or any nonprofit organization you may be a part of, that is not a very comfortable place to be. So first things first, I know that this webinar is all focused on fund development and it's funny, but so many organizations that contract with me as a consultant, their first thing they say when I get in the door and I just always anticipate it is, how are we gonna raise more money? We're so excited that you're here. Tell us how to do it in like 20 minutes or less and then we're just gonna go. And that's always a little disheartening when I kind of open the door to say, okay, let's ask some questions first. You know, before we can even sit down at the table with a potential funder or be involved in a conversation with one of our partners, we need to make sure that we have some things in place that really help us communicate the mission of our organization, the work of our organization, why people should get involved, and what we foresee for the future. So that's really what this webinar is going to be about today. It's going to be about making sure that we have those key messaging pieces in place so that we are prepared and ready to go after funding. So let's start with our mission. The mission statement is the reason that your council exists. The vision statement is that look out into the future. You know, um, mission statement is something that we really don't want to see change from year to year or even every five or 10 years. But vision statement is something that I, I would typically encourage councils or other organizations to think out about three years, you know, three to five years at the max, and ask ourselves, what is a long-term change resulting from the council's work? The case statement, that's our story. And that's what the one piece that so many organizations neglect to focus on because we say, as we do, it's human nature, we just don't have the time. You know, this is all great, Jen, but we just don't have the time to do it. Well. Usually those organizations come back, back to me about a, in a year's time and say, you know, remember we were talking about that case statement, but we're still struggling with getting that funding. So we think we're gonna take the time to really look at ourselves and, and clarify our messaging so that it doesn't just make sense to us, but it makes sense to the broader public and those specific targeted donor groups. So my point there is, it is definitely worth the investment to take the time in developing our story. And then of course, ongoing planning efforts, implementation and accountability. And that's all about establishing fund development goals, a timeline associated with those goals, measurable outcomes so that we can know when we've achieved our set goals, and then evaluate those practices to see what's working for us. And then of course, change the things that are not working. So mission statement check. I'm assuming that all councils here have a mission statement in place. And if not, that's okay, please don't drop off the call. You can still stay on, you're gonna learn something today. Um, if we have our mission statement in place, this is, these are questions or, or statements that we wanna ask ourselves about our mission statement. Because what our mission statement should do, it should clarify purpose and determine the direction for the council. Okay, it sets direction. So every idea that comes to us, especially um, in your position as a council, I'm sure you're getting ideas daily, we check it against our mission. You know, so we can say to those individuals or those organizations, that's a great idea, but that's not in line with what we do. That's not in line with our purpose. Now, ideally, I'd like to have you be able to refer those individuals in another direction, but again, it, it allows you to prioritize and make sure you're not taking on things that are uh, just in line, that are not in line with your mission statement. 
Your statement should also motivate your staff and your volunteers and supporters. It provides a, a template for your decision making focuses energy and attention so that we don't get all over the board. You know, so often I work with coalitions or, or councils and uh, even, even small nonprofit organizations and they're just frazzled. They have so much going on, but they really don't feel like they're accomplishing anything. And typically that's because they have so much coming in their door, but they're not using their mission statement as a tool to check and see what should they really be focusing on. And also, it's last but not least important, is send a powerful message to the public that this is why we're here. This is what we are doing for you, the community. And this is why you want us here. So one thing we want to do, um, I'm not asking you to do it right now, but between now and the next webinar that I hope that you'll tune in on, um, is check your mission statement. Check it over. Uh, if you'd like to bring it to the table and have me take a look at it, certainly that's something that I'd be happy to do. And you could get that to me through uh, Megan of course, but I do challenge you, take that mission statement, take a look at it and ask yourself, is it, is it accomplishing these things? Your mission statement should be short enough to remember and very easy to communicate, not just for you, the person who's super close to the organization, but even for those volunteers. And it should be strong enough to inspire. You wanna inspire people in your community to understand who you are, what you do, and more, even importantly, in, in relation to this webinar, you want to inspire your potential donors. You want to inspire your current donors so they don't become lapsed donors to get involved with the organization. So another mission check, you know, when you read over your mission statement, is it clear, concise, memorable, and informative? And this is when I'm shining the spotlight on uh, one council in particular, the Detroit Food Policy Council mission statement. I'm not going to read through that verbatim. It's something that you can certainly do while I chat here for a moment. But uh, Winona, I believe you're the individual affiliated with this organization, correct? It's Winona and Amy who's on. I don't, and Amy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Give you a chance. Yeah, Winona and Amy are on, I'm, and I'm unmuted and now. I keep doing it. No, no, I hope you don't mind that I put you in the spotlight. No, I don't, <laughs> thanks. Great. Um, again, this is a mission statement that's in place that I felt was um, very well written. And Winona, if you don't mind, if you can talk to talk a little bit here when we get uh, to the next level, which will be vision statement, and maybe just share with your peers of how you've used your mission and vision as a tool, that would be great. Heads up, okay, no problem. In a couple minutes. Uh, the point that I want to bring up here for those councils that maybe are not as developed or perhaps solely volunteer driven organizations, maybe you have a mission statement that's been sitting around since your inception, which could have been five, 10 years ago, and it's time to revisit that. Again, I want to make the point to reach out to your peers. You know, this is not about recreating the wheel. You have some very intelligent people out there like you who've done some really great stuff and want to learn from those, from those experiences. Core values is another really important piece of the organization. I was so excited to see Detroit Food Policy Council had these in place. Really, these would be established along with your mission and vision through a strategic planning process. That's a whole other webinar, so we're not gonna go down that road. I just wanna focus on the importance of core values and why do we even spend time establishing them? Um, the importance of core values is that it really shows people what you stand for as a council. Um, you can see there's some pretty powerful words listed here, justice, respect, integrity, inclusion, and transparency. Those words not only speak to your internal staff, potential board members, and volunteers, but they also speak to those individuals that are not within the organization, those that are outside, like your potential donors. When I read over a strong mission statement, strong core values, it says, hey, that's an organization that I want to be a part of. That's a council that I want to be associated with based on values. So very nice job with those core values. Vision statements. So typically, again, through the planning process, you would establish an internal vision statement, which answers the question, what does success look like for our council? Um, the one that we're going to focus more on today, because it's more focused with fund development and attracting people to our council, is the external. So it answers the question, what will our communities look like when our councils are 100% successful? So basically what that vision statement needs to do, it showcases the problem we need and then inputs the council's work, which is the purpose, 
and that problem is eliminated. Ideally, good, this could be 10, 20, 100 years from now. But again, that vision statement is the bigger picture. Again, looking at the vision statement for Detroit Food Policy Council, um, it really speaks to what the community lo will look like as the Detroit Food po Policy Council is closer to fulfilling its mission. And the idea behind the vision statement, when you're meeting with potential donors, be it uh, a foundation, a local business or corporation, they want to know, okay, I understand where you are now through your mission statement. I understand who you are through your values, but tell me where you're going. To see your part is in all of this and how will the community look when your work, um, through your work and when you're is said and done. So, Winona, if you don't mind uh, sharing, how have you used your mission and vision statements as a tool in um, conversations with potential donors or even the community? So, yes, um, all potential donors, they always want to know your vision and mission. So I'm glad that we have this developed. We just went through a um, planning a strategic planning process last year and updated this. Um, so we started with what the um, the original council members had um, come up with in 2008, and then we updated it. Um, and one of the things that it really does, as you were talking, it, it made me think, one of the things it does is gives us agency. A lot of times people are surprised as a council that we take on equity issues or justice mm -hmm. issues. But because it's right there in our core values, we feel empowered to do so. And we know that that is what our council, you know, bought into. So these are the things that um, we can come back and say, yep, this work, this work is right in our ballpark. Or sometimes, like you said, it'll let us um, understand that this may not be something that we should lead on. We can support it. But this wouldn't be something that as a council we would take on. Oh, great, great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to, um, again, support that statement with these are tools. Your mission, your values, your vision are tools for you to effectively communicate who you are and what you do and why people should want to get involved um, to the community. So we want to make sure that we start uses, using them as tools. If they aren't developed or if they need to be revisited, we want to do that. And, and this is all part of the fund development process. If we don't have those core statements of why we exist and the purpose that we serve in place, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to take that next step, which is that of building those relationships, seeking funds from foundations and individuals, and so on. Ben, can I ask a question yes. about the mission and vision? Um, how, I think sometimes, if you look at these as part of fund development, you might have somebody in your council to say, okay, well, what do the funders want? And shouldn't our vision statement say that? Um, but I know lots of our organizations have gone through really in-depth kind of self-evaluation to find those vision and mission. And I don't know whether um, having those being genuine and who the organization is is actually more powerful. I was wondering if you could talk to that. Yes, the mission statement, absolutely. The mission statement is not something um, that you, you could involve stakeholders in the, the development of your mission statement, most certainly, so that you can make sure that they have a voice at the table. But the mission statement is meant to, to, to share the purpose or stand for the purpose of the council. That's not something that you necessarily want external feedback and, and direction of telling who you should be, because then it can get very one-sided to that particular individual or organization. The vision statement, however, is something that's more of a process in developing it. It is, an, at that point, you are looking at, for example, community needs, potentially doing a community needs assessment, reaching out to stakeholders and asking, you know, what, what do you see, what, what is your greatest need in the next three years? And, and you are still, however, in control of defining what is the council's role in meeting that need. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yep. Oh, I am also now putting Markel on the spot, I think, right? Yes. I hope you don't mind, Markel. Are you there? We'll give a moment to mute. 
again, just an example of your peers um, putting together, doing some great work and putting things together, putting their, their mission, and in this case, their vision um, out on display and putting them in action and using them as tools, communicating to the general public as well as their potential donor base. So this is just a brochure. It's not very good quality. I apologize, Markel, but um, a, a visual brochure of seeing how uh, we can use our mission and vision and tools and actually put them into communication materials that we then share with our potential donors. Uh, Markel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. I would just like, similar to what Winona has done for us, can you share with us how you've used your mission and vision as a tool in attracting support, be it through volunteers or donors or the general public? Well, I think it helps us internally remember what we do, why we're doing it, and helps us, like you were saying earlier, really, really filter that. Um, as all of us know, that with food systems work, it's so broad in terms of what you could be working on, strategies, and, and this helps us remind us kind of our issue areas, but also our, some of our strategies and, and that we're working on policy change. Um, and so to that extent as well, it's helpful as we engage with the public. So the better we are able to internally kind of understand and particularly what we do, we can share that with people and um, get people interested and engaged in our work or tracking it, et cetera. Um, so it helps as people understand because I think a lot of times they just hear the name and just what we do. Um, and yeah, it's a, like, like you said, it's a decision-making kind of filter as well for us. Thank you, Winona and Markel. It's almost like that we rehearsed this because you guys are saying exactly what I want to hear. <laughs> um, to your point, Markel, it does, it, you need to consider your mission statement and vision statement, and they are important statements, but developing both of those pieces, uh, going through that process is equally as important because to Markel's point, it gets everybody focused and moving in the same direction. And when we have our staff and our volunteers participating in the development of those, it also um, ensures ownership on both sides of that as well. So any questions at all regarding the importance of mission and vision statements? Any other questions? Okay, moving on. So just when you thought we're done, we're not. Case statement. Uh, as I'd mentioned early on, a case statement is different from our case for support. It's a little bit more elaborate. It tells and shares your story of your council. So again, it said detailed rationale for, for a fundraising campaign, a specific campaign, or just fundraising or fund development for your overall council. And it's designed for both internal and external supporters. So basically, similar to your mission and your vision, it gets everybody on the same page with what do we exactly do? Who do we do it for? And why do we do it? It answers questions such as, what's our mission and purpose? What do we offer that nobody else does? What's that differentiator? Who do we serve and how? Why is the work we are doing important? And why should I care as a donor, volunteer, or community member? Um, a case statement isn't something that we just kind of think about and say, okay, yeah, we answered these questions. It's actually something that you want to document. It serves as the foundation of all of your communication tools, or else it should. Um, so, for example, if you're writing a grant request, that whole piece on organizational um, information, this would be where your case statement would come into play. If you were going to meet with an, a, a potential individual donor or um, a CEO of a corporation or a large foundation, this would start the conversation and help you articulate um, what the organization's all about, why your work is critical, and why in the world would they want to be involved? Why should they support your council versus the one million other things that they have an opportunity to support? And lastly, what impact will my gift have on the work of your council? The purpose for our case statement, it connects our programs with our community needs, documents the difference that we make in our community, serves as the core document for producing all communication materials, as I mentioned, identifies and validates our organizational needs, identifies strategies designed to address these needs so it shows that we're being thoughtful, explains who will benefit from our services offered, identifies the resources that are required to sustain our organization, 
explains why prospects should care and give, and answers the prospect's unasked question, how will contributing to your council meet my needs and interests and values? So again, that goes back to the importance of not only developing the communication piece, but as we meet with donors, if it's when we're picking up the phone to connect with a large foundation like Kellogg or Kresge, or if it's a smaller foundation like our local community foundation, we want to make sure that we understand their needs so that the conversation we're having is a tailored case statement, essentially, focusing on what our purpose is, who we serve, why it's important, and then lastly, why should I care? What is that connection between the council's work and the potential donor's work or interests? Sorry. And of course, it serves as a cultivation strategy. Any questions at all about case statement development? Does anybody have an example of how assembling a case statement, um, the process that you've gone through to do that and how it's worked for you? Don't make me give another example. <laughs> I also do have case statement examples that I'm happy to share through Megan as well. So kind of along with your questions, maybe I have two columns, list of questions, list of materials that would be interesting to look over, um, and we can certainly get those to you. So once we have our story together, right, once we have a really strong mission statement in place, once we have a vision statement that clearly communicates how we see our work impacting the future of our communities. And then how, once we have that case statement that brings all of those pieces together and the case statement integrates the donor involvement piece, how the donor interests align with our organization, then we want to sit down and talk about determining our funding sources. So as we talked about earlier, you know, we, it's very important that we diversify our funding streams mainly because there's so many opportunities for donors to give. Again, if it's a foundation or an individual donor, um, opportunities are really endless in small communities. So when we think about funding sources, these are some sources that you could consider. Individual donors, as I talked about earlier, which could include annual donors, um, which might, in your case, uh, you may, may do a spring appeal and a year-end appeal um, to start major gift donors and that would have to be determined by council as far as what you consider to be a major gift but these would be the individuals that you would not send a mail or to necessarily but you'd sit down and have a personal conversation with them plan gifts if you're more of a developed council um, are things to consider again understanding that most of you are not a nonprofit organization so you'd have to work through partnership um, with a fiscal sponsor or sponsor potentially to go down this avenue, but they certainly are options. Foundation giving, which I'm sure most of you are more familiar with. And again, we're talking here about the large foundations, you know, the Fry, the Kresge, the Kellogg, as well as our com local community foundations, which certainly should be considered as a resource for you, um, not just through their foundation dollars, but as a community partner because their connections with individual donors that are either currently given to the community foundation or potentially sitting on, your, on their boards, um, they're just a wealth of, of information for you and, and, or, and certainly should be considered a potential partner in fund development. Government grants, corporate and business sponsors, similar to foundations, many corporations and businesses either have money set aside for um, community impact or they have a foundation that might be set up within the corporation. And service organizations. So here I'm talking about your local Rotary, um, Lions Club, and things of that nature. Certainly they are smaller grants, you know, anywhere from $100 to up to $5,000. Um, but again, a potential funding source that should, should be considered. And then board and volunteer giving. I'm not, I, I know some of us may have uh, structured boards, some may not, have, may have less structured boards, but we certainly have volunteers that are associated with the organization. And we don't want to forget about those individuals because volunteers, again, as I'd mentioned earlier, are your greatest ambassadors, but they also are your strongest supporters. Now with some, you may get that 
the feedback of I'm already giving you all of my time. And uh, that's something that I know many of us are used to hearing. But if they're cultivated in, in the right way and stewarded along uh, from a relationship standpoint, your volunteers can also become some of your biggest financial supporters. And events. Um, I would never recommend that councils, especially those of the smaller size, throw a huge event. And that shouldn't be the, the focus of your fund development work by any means. But again, thinking of other sources and wanting to diversify our funding streams, that certainly is something that you can consider. Anything else that you guys want to add? Can you think of any other sources that I may have missed? No. You guys better not be watching TV during our webinar. I'm going to be hurt. <laughs> Jen, just a quick question um, of Hi, the events. Um, Hi, Larry. How, this is Larry from Hi, Larry. Michigan. How, how would you, rather than putting on an event for the purpose of fundraising, how would you take an event that you're doing for its own purpose and, and integrate the fundraising elements into that? Well, if you're doing an event that's more for community awareness, is that kind of what you're thinking of? Right, right. Okay. The way, the best way to incorporate that is to util, use your your communication tools. So, for example, um, the brochure that I referenced that Washtenaw had created have materials available with a call to action on them. So, if people are attending the event, usually they're pretty jazzed about the work that you're doing, and use that as an opportunity to get something in their hand to take them to that next step. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Good. So you always want to give people an opportunity to get involved, to ask questions, and have information available to them um, with a call to action. What type of event are you specifically referring to? Well, we've for the last five years or so done an event um, in Petoskey called the um, Around the Table, and our purpose has been to just try to bring diff players from different sectors of the food system um, literally around the same table to, to start some of the conversations and over or good food um, to help form some of those business relationships. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's, and, and we've approached that in, in some different ways or some with a variety of specific topics, but, but, you know, that's the kind of thing where they're, the, the point of the meeting isn't about fundraising, but it seems like there ought to be opportunities there to, to attract funders to support what we do. Absolutely. And now kind of knowing the makeup, you know, that's also a really good opportunity to use them as a resource. Funders, like all of us, like to feel needed as well, like to feel <laughs> that. And that is a real, when you have everybody around the table, even if it's only taking 10 minutes to do some brainstorming around ideas to attract potential funders, those funders may or may not be sitting around the table. Um, but again, giving them an opportunity to serve as a resource and provide you with recommendations and thoughts is a great way to initiate that, even at least plant the seed that, hey, that could be me, I could be a funder. And also gives them a chance to share some of their relationships and maybe make some connections. That's what I would do at that next round table. <laughs> great, great question, Larry, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Plan, plan, plan. That's another thing. Everybody says it sounds great. Boy, that's a really nice thing. I wish we had the luxury of doing, but we just don't have the time. Well, I'm kind of here to tell you that you should take the time. Um, having a plan in place is needed. Uh, all fundraising strategies that we've talked about to reach and motivate donors, it requires to have a plan in place. Otherwise, we're kind of doing things haphazardly. We might write a grant, we might you know, do a little mini solicitation among this group of donors, but at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we're really not moving the needle when it comes to big things like building capacity. Um, we might be funding small programs within our community, but yet we don't have the people on uh, within the council to do the real work that needs to be done because we don't have the funds to support that. So in order to reach your goals, you need to have that roadmap. You need to have that plan in place. In addition, 
This plan also serves as a tool. When you're meeting with donors, especially those foundations, and I'm even talking about your smaller community foundations, they wanna know your plan. You know, they think your vision sounds great. I get excited about it. I can't wait to see that happen, but how in the world are you gonna make that happen? And you need to be able to tell them how you're going to do that. Um, components of a fund development plan include your mission statement, check, we've already done that, vision statement, check, and strong case statement, and overall fund development goals. Fundraising projections for year one, two, and three. Again, I try to encourage councils and organizations to look at least three years out. If that seems like it's too much to handle right now, look one year out. You know, during your budget planning time, when you're putting the numbers together, don't just say, you know, what do we need? Ask yourselves, what do we want? What do we, what do we, what should we be doing in order to meet those needs more effectively? And put some numbers to those. Strategies and methods. You know, it's great to have financial goals, but how are we going to reach those? Metrics and evaluation. Again, we want to have measurable outcomes so that we can determine when we've reached those goals, and we also want to evaluate the things that we do, we're doing and and. The, making sure the things that are working, that we're either doing them consistently, um, but also making sure we're not wasting our time on things that are not working. You know, I hate to say that event, events are bad things, because they're not. They can be very helpful, especially when they're collaborative. But for example, if it's a small council and they've been doing the same event for three years and it's not generating any revenue for them or any income, or it's not building relationships for them, it needs to do one of those two things and fund development, it's time to move, move along, move along, and put that, put that uh, event away, but potentially, and focus your efforts on things that are working for you. And budget, you know, to raise money, it costs money. So we also need to make sure during our annual budget planning time that we incorporate some dollars that it may, um, the organization or the council may need to spend on fundraising. Does anybody on the, on the call now have a fund development plan in place that they could share their, their learnings with us? This is Markel, we don't, we don't have one in place. No. I mean, we've done some of these like things for specific grants, like replying to a request for a proposal and certainly have all these components in it, but we don't have a. Okay. And hi, this is Lisa from Ottawa Food. I joined late. Um, we are hi, just starting to look at this. We don't have one yet either. Do you both see where it would be helpful in your efforts in raising funds? Because it sounds like you're at that point where um, you either, either have had some success um, but are looking to develop your program a little bit more, that it would be helpful to have that plan in place? I feel like it definitely would. Again, it's just been a matter of um how much we've expanded and grown and needed did not have you know one extra minute to do one thing and now we're at the point where if we want to continue to expand what we're doing we're going to need um you know more staff time more capacity things like that so now we're at the point where um you know some of this starts to become priority so um we'll be looking to do that that's great and i'm just going to use you as an example you know the fund development plan um will look different for every organization as well so lisa you talked about capacity staff structure you know your fund development plan specifically for the next year to three years might look at building out that staff structure and um, identifying what the financial need is for that but also showing how the council will grow in its fund development program to eventually sustain that staff um, whereas a smaller council might have um, goals that are not so hardy. Maybe instead we're, we're putting a fund development plan together to support not one community program, but two in the next year. So again, I don't want anyone on the phone to be overwhelmed as far as the level of detail um, for a fund development plan. The point that we want to make is no matter how big or small, no matter how great or how, how um, in our infancy we may be in our fund development, planning is critical. And this, this is Winona real quickly. We, we have one. Um, it needs to be updated. And so I'm looking at the components of this one, and this will be good to take into account as we update ours. Fantastic. 
thank you for chiming in there because again that's another great example of leaning on your peers right none of us have to start down start sitting down with a blank slate none of us because people are already out there doing it you have this fantastic network of peers that are, are successful and in developed at you know a different level than your council be sure to reach out to them similar to Larry's round table you know think of all of you sitting around a table you know all these tremendous resources Put on the brakes for a minute and ask Winona for her fund development plan. <laughs> All right, and that is also a sample that I can certainly share with you, um, Megan, if you wanna make note of that, a template for um, getting started with that fund development plan. Yeah, that would be great. And we often have um, hands-on exercises when we get together in person. Perfect. Um, and also have been looking at um, putting together some learning cohorts. So if enough councils are interested in this, this might be, something where they can all sit down and learn and do things together on that subject matter. So we have, we have capacity to help that if folks are interested. Fantastic. So again, I just challenge all of you to put on the brakes and take advantage of that. And I say that because I've been where you are. When you're moving along at a rapid pace with your day-to-day -day responsibilities, trying to get it all done, it's tough to make this a priority. Um, but hopefully, if nothing else out of this webinar, you'll see that it's, it's really critical that you do. And you'll see, you'll see the benefits in short order, I promise. And if not, call Megan. It's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I can do it. Just seeing who's listening. Okay, so why plan? You know, aside from what has already been shared with the group, it's so important because a vision without a plan is just a hallucination and that has now become my favorite quote of all times because we can have that grandiose vision it can sound amazing and we can become super popular in our communities because of that grandiose vision but where i've seen organizations councils and collaboratives fall is when they don't have that plan in place to really make that vision a reality so the plan, the fund development plan, also helps your organization set priorities. Like I said, if you can look at it and compartmentalize it for like year one, two, and three, it shows you what you need to be focusing on and each year should build upon the next. It increases volunteer and board involvement. Once we have that roadmap in place, it sure is a lot easier to ask a board member or a volunteer to help with fund development efforts when we have a common direction, clear direction where we're all headed. It assists in diversifying our funding sources because it makes us think about it, right? It makes us not just say we need grant funding. It makes us say, okay, hmm, we've never gone after individuals for funding. Let's think about that. What might that look like? It limits crisis fundraising. I can never put eliminates because there's always an element of a little bit of sense of urgency when it comes to fund development, but it certainly does limit it because again, we're being more thoughtful and honestly, when we say to ourselves, we don't have enough time, what a plan does for you, it allows you to make sure that you're using your time wisely because it focuses your effort on specific things that you know are gonna help move the needle in fund development. It helps volunteers, board and staff set realistic income goals. And this kind of goes back to the mission, the vision question of should somebody from the outside be telling you what to do? And the, one of the main reasons why that's not a good idea because people could also be bringing great thoughts to you as far as new programs or services to offer in the community um, with, a, with a goal that is completely outrageous. So putting your fund development plan together also forces you to set realistic financial goals for your organization. So your organization grows along with them versus being completely unmotivated and, un and overwhelmed because you were not able to meet a goal that was just set too high and unrealistic. It outlines strategic steps to reach those goals. So it doesn't just say, hey, here's a goal. That's what we need to do to get to that vision. It forces you then to say, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? It also tells you who's going to do that. You know, because that's another very important piece, especially when we're limited. You know, if we have staff, usually staff's limited. If we don't have staff and we're all volunteer, our time is limited. So it forces you to put individuals in place or encourage them to get involved. Um, and then they will be accountable for ensuring that those goals and objectives are achieved. It avoids, pu it avoids pulling goal 
out of thin air. Just like, I don't know, that's a vision. This is our vision. I think maybe we can do this at this time. Let's just go for it. Um, what it, what it does when people say we need to set goals, if they're too big and they're not attainable, then it just, it sets us up for failure and it's just not something that you want to do. So putting a plan in place, putting it, a plan together with with more than just one person as an example, really gets everybody involved so that you're not only setting realistic goals, but you're having the conversation for those people who do want that pie in the sky so that they understand why we need to take this step first before we can get to that pie in the sky. This is just a point too, that when you revise your plan, whenever your operating budgets are revised, because again, raising money, it takes money to raise money. And it's really important that it becomes a part of our budget planning process so that we don't end up having um, raising funds, but then having a shortfall because we had our fundraising efforts exceeded what we brought in the door. Looking at goals again, you guys I'm sure are all familiar with this. Setting SMART goals is critical. This is, this is an old graphic, but I keep bringing it back because it is so relevant no matter what. We need to be specific when we set our goals. Again, not too pie in the sky. Goals and objectives need to be measurable. They need to be attainable. Can we do this with the capacity we have today? They need to be realistic and they need to be time bound. Making sure that we don't just set a goal and say, yep, we're gonna get to that this year. And then we all end up doing it in December right before the end of the year. So when we're setting goals, we want to make sure that we follow this uh, as this graphic lays out. They're specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Setting and achieving funding goals. So your first step in doing that is you want to look at what you've done in the past in order to plan for your future. You know, if, if this is our first step in putting together a fund development plan, um, maybe we haven't really done an assessment on any of the activities that we've done in the past. Well, that's the first thing that you want to do before marching forward. For monetary goals, consider creating low, middle, and high scenarios. So low would be this is what we have to have in order to break even. Middle would be this would create a little bit of extra for us to apply to potential programs, programs that might come our way that we weren't anticipating. And high would be this is if we exceeded our effort. And boy, look at what we could do with that excess funding. Set one over the top goal. And the reason I do that is because I try to tell councils and organizations to be pretty conservative when they're setting their goals. Again, not too pie in the sky, but I do encourage them to set one goal that's over the top. And the reason for that is because if you get people who are involved that are really passionate and wanna see big things happen, it's exciting to have that one goal in front of you. Now, I'll be honest, that usually carries over from year one to maybe year two, but it certainly is a great way to motivate staff, volunteers, and generate excitement among um, your donor population as well. It shows that you're shooting for the stars and you're not afraid to do that. Create funding model and mix that's required to support your financial goal. Again, we don't want to just have a number out there and saying by year end, this is where we want to be. We want to make sure we have the funding mix and a model that will support that goal. So often, and it's amazing to me that it still happens, but it's because we're all busy and we don't take time to plan. I might work with an organization or a collaborative and I ask, well, wow, where did you get that funding goal? And I'll say, well, that's what, that was the red. That's what we need to read, raise because that's what we're in the red. And I, with no strategy behind it, um, you know, no, no way to, no plan to really reach that goal. Uh, and it's just, again, setting the organization up for failure, it creates lots of frustration. So we want to make sure that fund development and planning for fund development is a part of our budget planning process. It defines strategies and tactics. So again, it doesn't just say, here's our great vision. This is what we're going after. Here are some goals that are going to help us get there. Once we achieve them, it tells you how you're going to do it. So often, people forget the how. And when you don't have the how in a fund development plan, then you have a plan that sits there and collects dust year after year after year. So that is one important piece that you cannot forget. Again, this is some redundancy here, but it does establish leadership, timing, and measurable outcomes. Equally as important as the how is the leadership. 
who's going to be accountable for making sure, for overseeing and making sure that these goals and objectives are achieved, and when is it gonna get done? Any questions as far as setting funding goals or achieving those funding goals? Any thoughts? Anyone feeling completely overwhelmed? Are we good? <laughs> well, um, Christine mentioned in the chat that everyone needs a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, and I think- I've heard we, that, that's good. Yeah, when, when we had talked also, um, you had talked about um, people being prepared to make that big ask um, in terms of, you know, if I had, if I had $10,000, this is what I would do. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that's something that um, a lot of local food councils don't always, don't always immediately gravitate to. It's, um, sometimes it's a lot more of, you, you gotta get through, we'll have a food summit where 300 people are coming. Um, and the idea of that is a community event to do education, but we're just trying to get through that. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. And I've heard that big, hairy, audacious goal. And I love that too, because people don't ever think they're gonna be, or councils or, or collaboratives don't feel they'll ever be in that position where someone does slap a $20,000 check on them. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, you don't really have a process for that. Um, and again, that's a whole other webinar, fund development processes. But um, to that point, you want to have an idea in mind, you know, that almost goes beyond the vision. Because typically what will happen when you go through this, this process of really establishing the mission, the vision, the case statement, and your fund development plan, again, you're not only going to get more popular in your community, you're going to get more popular among donors. And you're going to start talking in their circles. So the chance of you getting... I say 20,000, it could even be a $5,000 check. That could be a major gift for you. You're gonna to wanna to have an idea of where that's, where could we apply that? So that's a great point. And I love that term too. I might change mine. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Okay, so getting started. First thing you wanna do is identify who do you think you might invite to the planning process for fund development. Again, we don't wanna develop this plan in a silo. We don't want it to be the chair of a committee or one person you know, that leads the council at this time. We really wanna make it a collaborative effort. If we don't have a lot of people to choose from at this time, you think about who are the good thinkers in the group? Who are the ones that really contribute to productive discussion? Um, what are maybe some current donors that we have out there? You know, if you have a good relationship with your community foundation and the program officer, again, people sometimes look at that community foundation as the funder. We can't, you know, we can't bear all, we can't be too transparent. They are a partner as you can, you should consider all funders a partner, but specifically that community foundation, um, you know, could be a great resource for you in that process as well. So identify and invite who should be involved in the planning process and then start with just asking some simple questions. You know, if this is going through the fund development planning process is not something that, that you would bring in someone from the outside to facilitate, if you think you're at a point right now where you just wanna to try to get the ball rolling internally, then just start with some simple questions. You know, what do you wanna accomplish next year to work toward achieving your vision? What level of funding do you need to accomplish what we wanna do next year? Just getting that conversation started, that generative discussion around that and tying some financial goals to that is a really good first step. What strategies are currently in place to help reach our goals? So what are we currently doing that is structured, that is helping us work towards those goals? What new strategies must be implemented? So again, it, I don't want you to look at the planning process as a huge process that's intimidating that we're gonna have to, yeah, let's put that off till fiscal year 2020, just a little too much. You can start right now, just by gathering a group of thought leaders together within your organization and some from the outside and start asking these questions as a good first step. Is there anything uh, that I may have missed that some of you that are more seasoned wanna add to that? Okay. So then of course we do all these great things and we need now the really, the big thing we need to do is we need to make it happen. Get your plan on paper, please. Again, it can't be one of those things that we had this 
We had a really great conversation. We gathered all these people together. I took some really good notes and that was about three months ago. Okay, when you get sit down at the round table, I love that, that thought, and really give, give some real serious thought to strategy behind your fund development efforts, put it down on paper. If you already have a working plan, like some of you have already shared, then continue to brainstorm ways to build your pool of donors, increase donations, and increase your touch points. And touch points are those things, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that term, you know, when are we talking to our donors when we're not asking them for money? Because that's really important, um, really important part of that cultivation and stewardship process. So hopefully you can see now by effective planning and implementation, it will lead to successful fundraising. Without a plan, without all of those key pieces in place, like your mission, your vision, and your case statement, it makes it very challenging to go out into the world and say, hey, support us just because we're, we're awesome. You know, we got, we got to have a little, you are all awesome, don't get me wrong, but we have to have the thoughts and the plan and the strategies to back that up to truly bring people on board. Just having those things in place along with a plan, doesn't have to be a robust plan, but a thoughtful plan shows our funders that we mean business and we envision ourselves as being around for a long time because of the need that is there and that we are ready to meet that need with their involvement. So now we're gonna kind of go into the second piece of this. Once we're all prepared and ready to go, what's the mo most important thing for us to focus on? And that truly is building relationships. Oops, I forgot about that. I'll talk about that after I show you this fun little slide. <laughs> So we talked about successful fundraising. So your question then might be, okay, great, but where's the money? Show me the money. As you can see by this graphic here, most giving is done by individuals. Followed second, but a pretty far second from foundations. Then we have bequests and corporations. Um, this also can, this is, this is looking at the huge big picture. So you also have to think about this in your community. So for example, you may have some big foundations within your community, so this might be, um, this breakdown might look a little bit different. But when you look at this on a broad scale, again, most giving is done by individuals, then second followed by foundations. So those are kind of the two area, those are the two groups, if you will, that we're gonna focus on for this conversation today. Now I can segue into my uh, fund development success is building relationships and partnerships. So in order to build those relationships and partnerships, we, we need to identify what those may be. We need to cultivate those relationships and partnerships. We need to make the ask. Then we need to steward and we need to track. So identifying meaning, means looking at our current pool of donors, right? Be it their foundations or individuals, corporations or businesses, and say to ourselves, this is our list. Who might we be able to get connected to even within, a, within this donor base or this donor pool? Um, so that's one way to initiate some new relationships. As far as cultivation goes with that donor pool, with those existing relationships, it's really critical that we continually stay in touch with and develop relationships before we make the ask. Some organizations, when they can't avoid crisis fundraising, you know, they might have to jump the gun and make the ask because the funding is needed immediately. But in the ideal situation, we want to look at fund development and donor relations as going hand in hand and taking the time to use all the tools that we just talked about in developing important relationships is your next focus, should be your primary focus. And then of course, making the ask, stewardship is one area that breaks my heart, that so many organizations, um, nonprofits, you know, collaboratives, councils, they, they neglect this part. And I don't wanna say they do it intentionally, but so often, it's like our family members, you know, those family members that you love and you're so close to, they probably don't get a Christmas card because you know they know, they feel they know that you care. They don't need to hear from you but they do just like donors, those donors that are so devoted to you and they, they, they're your closest friends, your strongest ambassadors, they need to be thanked, you need to involve them and you need to communicate with them. And you can't do that enough. 
It's so much easier to keep a relationship with a donor. If it's a foundation, because we treat them as we would an individual major donor or an individual, it's so much easier to continue that relationship than it is to find a brand new donor. So we wanna make sure once those relationships are in queue and they are strong that we keep them that way through stewardship. And lastly, as we're developing these relationships, some of you might have sophisticated software in place. Some of you may not be tracking them at all. Maybe they're up, you know, on a bunch of note cards in a box. Other of you may be tracking them in an Excel spreadsheet. And that, uh, that is probably, a Excel spreadsheet would be, is, is fine in most cases. But the point here is, is we just wanna make sure that we're tracking our donors, they're giving history um, and their areas of interest. Megan, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering um, how government grants or somebody that you might regularly apply to a grant to go comes into this. Um, because every so often that's something that food councils um, will use or their partners will use. Mm -hmm. Well, government grants are a little different. You know, you don't have the opportunity. <laughs> There's a reason I don't I don't write a lot of government grants, and the you no, know, but my main reason is because I'm more about relationships. So unfortunately, with those types of grants, you don't necessarily have that opportunity. They're very cut and dry. They're very um, uh, as far as the information that's provided, you need to provide exactly what's been requested. So the best advice that I can give um, with government grants is making sure that you work with your collaborative partners, be it those that are in your region that you're jointly applying for that grant together with, if they have more experience in developing the materials required for the grant, but also reach out to your network of individuals um, to learn about opportunities, as well as learn about successful grants, how they were carried out, how they were, um, outcomes were measured. That's a huge one. I think that deters some from applying for those larger state and federal grants. Um, but as far as following this process and building relationships, um, the relationships are really more on the partner side and how do we come together and develop a grant that's appealing at the state level versus developing relationships with the state. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions on that? So identifying prospects, foundations, corporations and businesses, service organizations, individuals and major donors. The reason why I've pulled these um, specific potential donor groups uh, out of the pools because that's what we're going to focus on. That's what will relate to uh, the following slides here today. To Megan's point, there, there are other funding sources available to you. Again, state and federal, I'd almost like to do a webinar specifically on that. I find that it is, it's, it's so different. But in relation to foundations here, I'm referring more to your, your private and public foundations, corporations and businesses as corps and businesses or as a foundation within and then your local service clubs and individuals. So process, prospect research um, is, is very important. Um, another one of those areas that, that some organizations do neglect, uh, instead they might just hear of a grant opportunity and then go after it versus being proactive. You know, doing your due diligence is just, and doing prospect, prospect research is just a proactive approach um, to grant writing and to um, approaching potential funders. So first of all, be it a foundation or individual or a corporation, you're gonna to wanna to know their background. So what is their giving history? You know, what have they been giving to uh, as far as other organizations and entities within your community? What are their funding guidelines, especially specifically to foundations, but even major potential major donors might have small family foundations, so we consider those individuals. Um, typically will have guidelines. So you wanna make sure that the work of your council and those other affiliated programs align with their guidelines and areas of interest so that you can have a conversation with them um, that showcases their areas of interest. And then don't forget to ask the question among your board and volunteers or even your other peers, if there is anyone who has an affiliation or a connection to the foundation or the individual. And the reason for that is that 
even though you may be the one to rate the grant um, or have an initial you know, conversation, you might not necessarily be the one who can contribute to that relationship piece. So foundations, for example, if you're calling um, a foundation like your community foundation or even one of the smaller family foundations, if someone is connected to that uh, leadership within that organization, it makes more sense for them to be well equipped to make that initial phone call and kind of build that bridge. And same goes for individual donors. You know, even though you may be leadership for your council, there may be some a volunteer whose brother is a millionaire. I'm just <laughs> making that up, but wouldn't that be nice? Um, so obviously the relationship builder, you might not be that first point of contact. You wanna work through those individuals that already have that connection. Because obviously when it comes to giving funds, especially substantial funds, you know, donors, at a foundation level, individual level, need to have that level of trust. And typically going through that connection is your best option. So you wanna reach out to board and volunteer members and before you even write a grant or before you approach an individual, you know, you ask, do you have any connections um, that maybe could help us win this grant or help us develop the case? Any questions on prospect research? Any other success stories that anybody wants to share when it comes to prospect research or working through connections to, to develop relationships with foundations or individuals? Uh, I have a question about uh, knowing about giving history. Mm -hmm. If it's an individual donor, how would you find out that information? The World Wide Web is amazing. So that's where I start. You know, I guess I shouldn't say that's where I start. I start with reaching out to the board and volunteers or other individuals first and asking, do you know this individual? Have you ever interacted with them and, um, at another organization? Um, and understand first, you know, if we have somebody who's already connected, it makes it very easy. If not, even just doing a Google search on that individual um, using keywords like, I don't know, we could say Jen Boer, you know, major donor to nonprofits in Detroit, and you might find annual reports that come up from other um, organizations that list this person at a certain giving level. But typically, your best bet is to work through uh, other connections and make sure that you're reaching out to the people who are close to your organization to see if there's someone who has that information. Did I answer your question? Yeah, actually, just um, uh, more of a Sorry, comment. I muted myself. Thank you. It's <laughs> helpful. Um, what you're sharing, Jen, sounds a lot like what um, Jean Doss, our legislative consultant, um, tells people for policy development. Um, that when they're talking to policymakers, um, they need to know what they want, but then they need to know who's the best person to ask and accept that it may not be them. Um, it might be somebody who has that relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing echoes of the same thing here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. critical. And that's a piece where, you know, all egos are aside. And I'm sure we, most organizations don't have to worry about that. But it's, it's important to remember that the trust factor is huge when it comes to attracting new donors and sustaining existing donors, uh, as well as having, having that relationship really is that first step in developing that trust for people to want to learn more about your organization and how they can get involved. Great. Another piece too, if you can note, Megan, because I'm looking at the clock already, I can't believe how fast it goes, is I have um, suggestions for creating relationships with new potential donors and, and um, uncovering giving history. It's just a, it's a write-up that, that I think might be helpful to provide to as a follow-up to this. Okay. Yeah. I just need that reminder. We can do that. Great. Another uh, element of fund development success, as I mentioned, is cultivate, creating that connection, building relationship before we make the ask. So once we learn about them and we're not going blind, you never want to go blind into a call or even into a letter by writing a generic letter that, that doesn't show that you know anything about the individual or that at least doesn't give reason as to why you're contacting them. Um, 
So now that you, you want to first then get their attention, this can be done, say, let's just say, for example, you have found a major donor that you're interested in talking with or a foundation whose guidelines align with the mission of your organization. Um, you're either one, going to write a letter or make a call and introduce yourself. Typically with a major donor, individual donor, I would recommend writing a letter and giving reason as to why you're connecting with them. And in that letter, you would request a time to meet and also um, let them know that you'll be following up with a phone call. For a foundation, it's just making a phone call and, and finding out, uh, you know, with the larger foundations especially, who's your program officer and having a conversation with them before you even have that initial discussion um, that most foundations require before you write the grant or before you even submit that letter of intent. Again, it's just introducing yourself so they have a voice with a name and a personality with the organization. And again, understanding that you may not always be, even if you're the leadership of the organization, the appropriate person to make that call. But if you're not, and there is somebody who has that closer connection, you are gonna to wanna to make sure that you've done your job informing that person so they're well equipped to have a productive discussion. Then once you have their attention, you wanna invite them for a site visit or a tour. Um, I know that most of the councils probably don't have a physical location necessarily, as many organizations don't, but it could even be, it could even be a virtual tour, meaning if you have the resources to put together a small abbreviated video that showcases programs or services um, that really communicate your mission and action in your community is something that you could share with them. Um, you could invite them to a partner program, again, where potentially through the um, existence of the council, this program is in, is in existence. And look at this, here it is in action. Invite them to be a part of that and witness that. Again, the whole intent behind that is for them to develop an appreciation and a connection for the work that you do. And of course, engage your prospect using various communication tools. You know, it's very unlikely that through your first phone call, um, and letter and potential meeting that you're going to be ready to make that ask right away, specifically with individuals. So um, you want to take the opportunity to cultivate your relationship by making sure that they have the link to your website, that they are um, receiving updates from you, either through your newsletter, or if you don't have a newsletter, you know, and you're thinking, and you're having conversations with donors that have a great giving capacity, maybe once a year you put together a list of your accomplishments and you're making sure that you get that in front of them. So you're spending time not just introducing yourselves and saying, hi, think of us next year, but cultivating that relationship. So then in six to eight months to a year's time, the next time you talk with them, you're ready to make that ask. Any questions as far as cultivation? Does anybody have any examples of any cultivation tools that they've used that have been really, have produced good results for them in working with your donors? I mentioned newsletter as one. Anybody use social media as a cultivation tool? seeing some potential webinars down the road <laughs> Maybe um, now. yeah how much so how much time should somebody expect or does it go from donor to donor to cultivate that relationship I mean mm -hmm. I can see some people saying well I give it a month and nothing happened I'm ready to call it off um, Typically, with an end of, for the foundation, the time frame would be shorter. So, for example, if you connect with your program officer, develop that relationship, they do a site visit, you're going to be ready to write a grant that next grant cycle is the, is the hope anyway, right? So, say their grant cycle is in April and, and October, you meet with them at the first of the year so that you can meet that April grant deadline. With individual donors, it's a little bit different, and it certainly is a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on, for example, if you have a strong, if you have an individual who's who's very connected to a donor and has a very strong relationship, you may be able to turn around and get a contribution, you know, during that initial meeting. Now that's really rare, especially when I think of, you know, all primarily volunteer organizations, that whole donor relations process is truly a process and you need to be willing 
and aware that you need to invest the time, which could take anywhere from 12 to 18 months before you, that donor is ready to say, yes, I believe in you and I'm ready to do this. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Any other questions or examples? Okay. So you're at the table, now what? So you've got their attention, you've had an opportunity to tell them a little bit about who you are and, and why they should be involved. Making the ask. So this is now to the point where with a foundation, again, as I mentioned, the timeline might be much more would be a lot quicker with an individual. It could take anywhere, you know, from initially that first meeting if you're if you're fortunate, but typically it can take anywhere 12 to 18 months to develop a relationship, depending on the size of the ask too. I should probably, Megan, make that point. You know, if if major gift for you is five hundred dollars and the capacity of a donor is ten thousand, but you're only asking for five hundred, you know, that turnaround time can be a lot quicker. Um, but regardless, the next step when we feel we've gotten that donor to a point where it, it doesn't feel like an ask, I guess that's the best way to explain it. And that's at least, that's always my barometer. That's when I can feel I'm not asking for money. At this point, I truly feel when I'm talking with this donor, I'm giving them an opportunity to get involved with and support a great thing. That's when you know that that relationship has gotten to that point. So when you're to the level of making an ask, um, you wanna do two things. One thing is not documented here, but for each donor, again, if it's a foundation or an individual, a corporation or a service organization, I always make a profile page. And I'll list on that profile page the name of the, the organization, individual, or foundation, what their areas of interest are, their giving history, who they've given to in the past, what their link is to our organization or our council in this case and their ability to give to us, so their capacity. So then I have these profile pages on file. If I have a sophisticated donor management software, I have it electronically saved on file. If I don't, if I'm using an Excel spreadsheet as a startup, that's fine. But you just wanna make sure that you're saving these in a place that you can revisit them. And then beyond that, when you're preparing for the meeting or preparing to have a conversation with the donor, if it's in person or over the phone, you wanna have a script written. And when I say that, you wanna read it and then you wanna, you wanna kind of put it aside. Because the last thing that we wanna do is sound scripted. So if you feel you're gonna sound scripted when you go to the donor, there's one of two things that might be the issue. You're either not comfortable yet with making an ask just as a person, or that donor is not ready. If you're not comfortable as a person, this just feels a little bit out of your comfort zone, I want you to, you could do one of two things. You could get comfortable, by practice makes perfect, or you could take someone with you. It's not inappropriate to have two people go with you on an ask, if it's with a foundation or an individual or a business. So keep that in the back of your mind. As the practice, or the process of going through writing a script or the purpose of writing that script is just so the conversation doesn't get out of control. You always want in the back of your mind have a certain path that conversation should go. Now don't be married to the path because it's going to go off in different directions once you start that conversation, but writing a script will certainly help you guide that. So set in, within that script, set your goals for the meeting conversation, your ideals, what you hope to walk out of there with. Create your talking points. Within their talking points, you want to share the impact that the council is having on the community in addition to what the impact of their giving would be. Let the donor lead the conversation, kind of. So when I say kind of, we, I, I, my favorite thing in the world is donor relations, just so you, I love people. So, and I love to listen and I love to get stories, but I always go in knowing I'm here for the organization. So I could listen all day long about an individual's accomplishments and things they've done in life, but I have to remember, I have to be able to bring that conversation back to accomplishing the goals for the meeting for me. If that's leaving here with a check in my hand, leaving here with another meeting set up, leaving here with a confirmation that they're attending our, our fundraising event, whatever that is, even though I do want the donor to lead the conversation so that they feel as though they're a part of it, 
I don't want them to take us too far in the other direction. Um, be flexible with your approach. And what this really means, like I said, you know, you want to have that script in place, but you need to be flexible. Because when we go into a meeting with a donor, again, if it's a foundation, if we're fortunate enough to get their ear and have a conversation before we send in that letter of intent, or if it's an individual corporation or, or, or a service organization, we go in with that script, which is our ideal. But nine times out of 10, they also have an ideal in mind. So we need to make sure that we can be flexible and that that, conver that conversation is truly a conversation. And um, we don't want to keep interjecting what our goals are to make them feel as though it's been rehearsed and that we have, you know, intentions and we're not leaving until we get the answer we want. So be flexible. Two key areas that your conversation, and again, I want to reiterate conversation because that's exactly what it should be. The future of your organization, which again, if you go through the process that we discussed earlier in this webinar, you'll have that all you know, set to memory on um, the future of your organization you want to share as well as incorporating the donor's interests, concerns, and goals. Now interests, obviously, you want to make sure that you're not really explaining to them, but bringing up examples, you know, where they see their interests align with the work of your council. One thing we don't want to do, and I have to pull this out because I never thought it would happen, but it does, we don't want to be so well rehearsed on the donor's history that we appear as though we could be a stalker, right? <laughs> you know, so when I say incorporating the donor's interest into the conversation, you want to do that through examples of your organization's work or through partnership work um, that has been supported by your organization. We want to keep in mind concerns. Uh, this is just an example that, you know, we need to be ready for if, if, if something, you know, a conflict or, or there's been something, for example, that's made the news, our council's made the news for maybe not the right reasons, that we're ready to address concerns, um, that we have that pitch in place uh, if, if it's something that the donor may address. And especially when you're talking about things, you know, with the council like policy, there could be situations your donor might not agree with. That's not why you're there for that meeting, but it's part of who you are. So you need to be ready to talk to that very openly and transparently. And then, of course, goals. Um, you want to focus the conversation not just on the goals of the organization, but even ask that question um, specifically of a foundation, but also um, individuals and corporations. You know, what are your goals as, as, uh, as a donor, and how can we help you achieve those? So when you think about areas you want to center your conversation around, these are two very important areas. This is my favorite one. This is what I had to really work hard at. But uh, the number one strategy that will lead you to a productive discussion, if you're an extrovert, this is really important. If you're an introvert, you need to still listen to this, but <laughs> is, is to listen, is to listen to the donor. You know, so often we get into our conversations and we see, we play off of their enthusiasm typically, and then we can tend to go on and on and on and on and on about, the great work that we do. And one of the most important things when you're in a conversation with a potential funder is to listen to that funder. Make sure that you too are asking questions and then listening to those answers. When you go into these meetings, you wanna make sure that you know your donor, you know your counsel, you know yourself. Again, Am I an extrovert? I need to know that I need to dial it back a little bit. If I'm an introvert, I need to make sure that I'm contributing to the conversation. Okay, know yourself and adapt. Because we're always gonna go into meetings with an ideal. We're always, even if it's a com conversation, a telephone conversation with a foundation, and it could go off into an area that we didn't anticipate, we need to be able to adapt to that. Always keeping in mind, right at the forefront, the mission of the organization and the purpose of the phone call or the meeting that we're having. Any questions at all uh, regarding the number one strategy in successful fund development? Anybody have any examples that they want to share in conversations with donors, individual donors or foundations?
All right. How much time do we have? Oh, I'm sorry, I cut into your question time, but now I'd like to open the floor up for questions. If you guys have any questions at all, I know we were moving like a bullet train uh, through this webinar. It's a lot of information for you to decipher, but my hope is between now and the next webinar, if you have any specific questions, if not right now, we can get those answered. I have one question. Um, are most councils, or do you recommend that they're there that they get their own nonprofit status? How many of the councils here are, and how do you um, deal with the funding? I guess if you're not, I think Megan and I can both speak to that. You can speak more specific to the councils. It wouldn't be a requirement from a fund development professional standpoint to have your 501c3 status. Um, you could certainly work through a fiscal sponsor. Um, to apply for grant opportunities like this, and as well as receiving individual contributions. Um, and Nicole, to answer your question specifically about Michigan local food councils, um, there's only one, um, and that's Detroit Food Policy Council, that it's its own 501c3. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, Christine Ranger just said, here on Shores is creating a nonprofit for that very purpose. Um, and then the Food Policy Council would be a standing committee of that. Um, but I know Markel's on the phone, on the call, and I know Washington County looked at that, um, and one of the things that came out of it was just the amount of accounting um, that you have to do with the new rules that came in the past five years. They found that a bit prohibitive. So, um, and then when you look at a national level, um, there's all sorts of variety as well, but not, it's more often that local food councils are not non 501 C3s of their own, that they're more associated with somebody who acts as their fiduciary agent. Um, but I think Jen could talk more also about how community foundations can really help fill that role or another partner like Goodwill, United Way, um, et cetera. Okay, because right now we've, we've discussed it with both of our food councils, um, and right now we've just been using um, an individual that's on the committee, their place of employment. So like we've done it with the food bank of being a fiduciary, um, the YMCA has done it as them being one, but I didn't know if it put too much on them or what the food councils do or how they handle it. Yeah, um, again, it, it, it's a whole variety of things, um, but I think sometimes, and also um, I'll defer to, to Jen, that might have to deal with the relationship as well. So because maybe your funder might also have to have a relationship with your fiduciary agent in order for them to feel comfortable, mm -hmm. depending on who the donor is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes. I would just yes. throw into um, that maybe this is a conversation that we could have um, on one of our monthly phone calls, yeah. because it is something that comes up pretty regularly. Um, you know, that debate that councils have of whether to go through the process of becoming a 501c3, um, pros and cons, working with fiduciary, becoming an arm of another organization. So um, maybe this is something we can kind of move to another space too and continue it, the conversation on. Yeah, I would agree. I think this is worth at least an hour of discussion because there is a variety of ways that you can do that. And then um, I think it'd be very interesting to see you know, from a national standpoint, how, how it's working in other areas. Because I do know the community foundations can serve as a really tremendous partner for you. I do know over the last, I guess, 10 years or so, they've kind of been pulling back on fiscal sponsorship because there was such a high, high request for that among nonprofit, potential nonprofits um, in, in various areas throughout Michigan. But obviously they're an option. There would be my first stop. To sit and have a conversation because they see all sides of it. They see a number of nonprofits that already exist in our community. Um, so they're going to ask some really great questions to help you determine if that's the right next step for you. Great resource. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Are you all super excited about fun development now? Yes. <laughs> this is Lisa again from Ottawa Food, I guess. Okay. 
one of my thoughts, I don't know if anyone else is feeling this way, um, or maybe it's questions is, you know, if, if kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg, like we need to expand staff capacity to be able to do more of some of this work. And so before we have the funding to do that, it's, it's uh, you know, so the initial fund developing that we're going to be doing, I just feel like it's going to be done on just a lot, not a lot of time. <laughs> so are not a lot of capacity to do that, if that makes sense. And so are there certain first steps or things that you think are more important than others? Um, you know, I find that we keep saying we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And all of a sudden, you know, we need the money for the things we've been talking about in two months. And so we're going out and doing some piecemeal things, just being completely honest. Um, but then when it comes back to it, even now, all the things you're saying are great ideas. I'm struggling to figure out how, um, you know, I can get my board and working meetings and things like that to even have enough time to, to go through some of these things. So I guess I'm just wondering if there's, you know, one or two first steps that it's like, definitely do this or, um, what your thoughts are about that. Well, that's a great question. And, um, as far as what, what must be done even for you to take that first step uh, would be making sure your mission is solid and then getting that case statement together. So even, I don't want to skip vision to the future, but you know, a lot, you're not alone when many organizations need to have that staff in place that can devote the time to visioning uh, and things of that nature. But two things that would be required even for you to approach, for example, a community, a community foundation or another foundation for capacity building or infrastructure development, you would need to have that mission in place and even just that one page case statement that answers who we are, what we do, um, who we serve and why should you care, just to start that conversation. But I'm very sure. happy to say, yeah, so those two elements and I am happy to say that um, you, could, you could develop a case statement with just a few you know, thought leaders within your council now, um, provided that your mission is in place. And I'm happy to say too that foundations are now more than they ever have in the past, understanding that they need to fund the people who make the work possible. So capacity building, infrastructure development are conversations that in the past they didn't look so appealing. You know, they expected organizations or councils to do that on their own, whereas now they're, they're really stepping up and helping fund those areas, provided that they work together with the council or organization in developing a plan so that it can sustain itself. Did that help? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm happy to have a conversation with you offline too at some time if you'd like that I can share an example of an organization that kind of just went through that process and what kind of materials they had put together to be successful, and at least hiring their first executive director. I could also, um, this is Liz for people on the phone, I could also see this um, potentially being, as Megan referred to at the beginning of the conversation, um, an area for a learning cohort, um, which we haven't talked about a whole lot uh, recently, but I think we'll, we'll get back into it in the next couple of months. Um, but to have a group of councils that's working on on something together for the next year or so um, and working with a TA provider, someone like Jen who has fund development experience, who has these templates. Um, so that, that might be an option both to help the councils that are able to participate in a cohort move through some of this work, but mm -hmm. also to kind of help create some templates that could be shared with the network um, so that it's, it's a little bit more, obviously all of, all of the councils are different, but um, if it can be a process, process that's a little more um, plug and play, <laughs> um, or at least you have some of the, the, um, the processes and the, the paperwork pieces of it or the, the um, spreadsheets that Jen has suggested would be helpful to be sharing information. Um, so maybe that's a conversation we can have at a later date as well. Be great. And keep in mind too, I keep referencing leaning on your peers and reaching out, you know, very, it's very unlikely that this is, you know, the, we're the first ones experiencing this challenge or achieving this accomplishment. You know, even if it's not just within Michigan, but nationally, 
um, you know, understanding how councils have developed from the startup to where they are now and bringing those individuals to participate in that discussion would be really valuable. Um, well, we have a few more minutes left. Jen, do you want to give a little bit of a preview of what folks can expect next time? Yes, next time we're just going to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into developing relationships and really focusing on those core, those donor groups that I, I suggested. And, and again, if you have others you'd like to add, um, you can do that, but I'll primarily be focusing on the foundations, uh, corporations and businesses, service organizations and individuals. Great, great. Well, did, any last questions for Jen before we close up? Or Liz or myself? Hi, <clears throat> Hi this is Winona. Just a um, quick question, um, or not a quick question, but what I'd like to see too is um, how to, I think we what we struggle with is people, People are more familiar with food as emergency food or planting or something like that, but not um, systems change or policy and maybe some ways of framing that to funders. That, that, that would be very helpful to us. As far as messaging? As far as framing? Exactly. I okay. mean, we, we've started some of it, but yeah, how do you, how do you move folks towards a long-term change or seeing the value of it? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Um, and we had a, well, that, that's great, a great point, Winona, because that's often some of the hardest communication that local food councils have. Um, to, um, but we got a question to the chat from Larry Dyer was to, the PowerPoint will be available. Yes, yes, it will be, and as well as a recording. Um, and um, we've been making, lists of resources that we also share in Companion. Um, so um, the recording should be up by the end of the week. Um, and we will um, make sure that you guys, all of you who are in the webinar today have access to the slides. Um, but wanted to thank you all for participating. We had 17 participants from 10 different councils and two statewide networks. So that's excellent. Um, and we hope to see you all next week, same time, same place. Um, and for more information. Great. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Jen, especially. Thanks. Thanks. Yep, thanks and Jen. Liz. <laughs> so, all right. See you next week.